4 is the, uh, the first few verses of the fourth chapter is the telling of what? Uh, who, who's the main character that we meet in John the fourth chapter? Yes, the, the woman at the well. The woman at the well. And Jesus uh, has this interesting back and forth. The very fact that he's talking to her is an extremely interesting thing. Why is it so interesting that he's even talking to this woman? Samaritan. <laughs> yeah, uh, the kind of woman she was, the fact that she was a Samaritan, the fact that she was a woman, all those things factor together in, in the surprise that the uh, disciples have when they come back and see Jesus is speaking to this, this woman who comes out in the middle of the day who's a Samaritan, but he has a conversation with her, and how does he get that conversation going? Water, water. And she confuses, first of all, him meaning just physical water, and that's not at all what he means. How does he describe this water that he's got for her? Living, living water. The kind of water, it's not just living water, but the kind of water that you will never thirst again. So something that goes well beyond what physical water can do, something that can nourish us and provide life. In fact, it can provide eternal life. This is one of those places where Jesus not only uses some terms that uh, he knows people are going to misunderstand, but he goes ahead and provides the explanation, starts providing the explanation. So he uh, gets to know this, uh, well, he already knows this woman, but he, but he lets the cat out of the bag. He goes ahead and tells her that he knows about her, the fact that she's had how many husbands? Five. Five. And what's her state right now? Living with somebody. Yeah, uh, living with somebody she's not married to. And when he says that, what does she do? She changes the subject. That's exactly right. <laughs> what a lot of people do when they feel like, whoa, confronted and, and seeing a bad side of me. And what subject does she bring up? Where to worship. Where to worship. And what does Jesus answer to that? Time is coming and now it is. Spirit and That's exactly right. But as far as the Samaritans versus the Jews, who has it correct? Jews. The Jews do. That's exactly right. Okay. It's at this point, though, when the woman, uh, when she's so excited, the disciples come back, and the woman goes on back into the town. What's the name of the town? Sychar. She goes back into Sychar to tell the people uh, that, that here's somebody who's told me everything I ever did. Uh, uh, perhaps a little bit of exaggeration, but perhaps uh, uh, giving us an insight into her excitement when she goes and tells them that. So the disciples are having this discussion with Jesus, and uh, uh, they've gone in. Why did they go into the town? Get some food. They bring the food back to him, and what does Jesus say to them? I have food to eat you know nothing about. And they're thinking, again, physical food. Just like physical water, they're thinking physical food. And Jesus is challenging them to think a, a little bit deeper. So verse 34, my food, Jesus said, is through the will of him who sent me to finish his work. What does that mean? What does it mean when he says my food? That's what sustains it. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm here for. That's my purpose in life. That's what sustains me. That's what keeps me going, is uh, uh, doing the will of the Father. Uh, verse 35 is where we left off last week. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest. I like the way the NIV translates this, because when it says, don't you have a saying, he's not saying, he's not saying it's four months till the harvest. Do you, do you understand what I just said? He's not saying it's four months to the harvest. He's saying you have a saying that says it's four months to the harvest. So you, you can't use this to try to figure out what time of year this is taking place. He's just using a proverb, right? This proverb that he uses, though, four, time, four months till the harvest, what's the purpose of that proverb? Can you, can, can you pull that apart and understand what that one means? If you lived in an agricultural society, farm territory, and they had a saying like this, what's the, what's the meaning of that proverb? It's, it's almost time. Almost time. Better get ready. Don't, make, don't, don't go on vacation, <laughs> you know, but make your plans well, right? Be prepared would be a short way of saying this, I think. And so he says, I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields, for they are ripe to the harvest. Okay, when he says, open your eyes and look at the fields, if he's standing there, who's he talking to? Disciples, Disciples where are they? At Jacob's well outside Sychar, right? What has just happened? He's just been talking to a woman. Where'd the woman go? And what is she doing back in the town? Telling him a little bit. 
Everybody. Telling everybody, you got to come see this guy. Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples, and he says, look. So if they're <coughs> literally lifting up their heads and looking, what are they going to see? A whole bunch of people from Sychar coming out to check out what this woman said, right? And what does Jesus say about that? He says, look, I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. By the way, over in Matthew, the ninth chapter, you've heard Jesus talk about this before. When Jesus talked about the fields being ripe unto harvest, what did he say about that? What did he say we should do about that? Pray. Pray. Pray for what? Yeah. Pray for workers for the harvest because uh, here's an opportunity. We need to take advantage of this opportunity. We need to respond to this. So let's be ready for the work. Okay. Notice how he, yeah, let's be ready for the work. Let's be ready for God's work, right? Notice this reminder, though, in these next uh, two or three verses. He says, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and, the har and harvests a crop for eternal life. I'm glad he threw that in there. Just to remind us, we're not just talking about crops. This is not a lesson on farming. Mm -hmm. This is using farming to help us better understand what it's, what it's about to do God's work. So just like being good farmers and ready for the harvest, which, by the way, I can't, I can't get past this. How many of you have a background in farming or have family that do? Okay. When people, and I don't, I mean, uh, my mom it grew up in the farm and stuff like that, but I tell you what, living in the area where there are a lot of farmers are, are being able to speak, have revivals in those places. When it's harvest time, you don't see them. <laughs> because they're out there, in fact, now with the lights on the tractors and everything, they are out there 24-7. <laughs> they don't put in 40-hour weeks, they put in 160 Eight hour weeks. Is that how many hours there are in a week? <laughs> My mathematicians will correct me if I'm wrong, right? They're, they're putting in, it's hard work at harvest time, but, but you save up, you prepare for it because it's worth it. it. It's worth it. It's a great analogy here. So he says, the one who reaps draws a wage and uh, harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper, what's a, what's a sower and a reaper, guys? What's the difference between a sower? What's a sower? What does it mean to sow? Plant. Plant. What's a reaper? Yeah, yeah, good. Just want to make sure we understand our, <laughs> since a lot of us are not farming people, <laughs> make sure we understand. Okay. Uh, um, the sower and the reaper will be glad together, together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Okay, then who did work for this? Who planted this seed? Who did? Okay, okay. In large part, Jesus did. Is there anybody else who's come before them who's done a work? John the Baptist has done a lot of work before they did. So you know what? You're not having to go out here and start from scratch. You can build on somebody else's ministry. You can reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. I take this so so personally, so many times, because as a preacher, I get to baptize a lot of people that, that somebody brought into my office or called me up and said, hey, I've been talking to this person for a year. <laughs> Will you? And I'm like, well, I'd be happy to, but you know, you ought to bet. But, but you know what? Uh, being part of that, uh, uh, a lot of people get to play different roles, different parts of the process of bringing people to Christ. And Whatever part you play, it's an important part. Doesn't this make you think of 1 Corinthians chapter 3? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it's around, uh, before verse 9, it'd be the first half of that chapter, like verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. Paul has already been talking about there shouldn't be divisions in the church. Remember back in chapter 1, he talks about some people say, well, you know, I was, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Apollos. Right? He says, don't do that. When the third chapter, he comes back to this point of division again, and he said, it's like a garden. He said, Apollos is the one who planted. Is it Apollos who planted? Paul planted. Who, plant, who watered? Yeah. One planted, another watered, and it's all the same garden. We're all doing the same work, even though different people play different roles within that process. Uh, I'm just going to throw out one thing that, that I think is important to remember. It's extremely rare. In fact, I'm not so sure I've ever experienced somebody planting the seed, watering it, weeding, 
harvesting, doing the whole thing, spiritually speaking, all by themselves. It, do you understand what I mean by that? What I mean is, it's extremely rare where somebody makes a contact with somebody who's not a Christian and does the entire process of discipling them and getting them in a place where they're ready to be baptized, baptizing them, and helping them go in Christ. Because we're a body. We're, uh, we're workers in the same field. And a lot of times, there are other people who help in that process. And I, I just think that's an important reminder. Anyway, that's the thing Jesus brings up here, saying we're all in this together and we're doing the, the same work. Okay, verse 39, many, so he's preparing them for the Samaritans come out. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Okay, what has the woman said so far as far as we know? Wow, this guy knows stuff that no normal person knows. At first she thinks he's just a prophet. But finally she realizes he's the promised one. Could you be the promised one? Yes, the one who speaks to you, I am he. Right? So she gives that testimony. And, and by the way, here they say it again. Uh, because of the words uh, of the woman, he told me everything I ever did. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. The word for word here is the same word for word back in the very first verse of this book. It's the word logos, which means rationality. It means reasoning. In other words, uh, Jesus was explaining things to them, helping them better understand. Verse, uh, verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is a savior of the world. The savior, sorry, the savior of the world. Okay, a growing faith here. They believe because of what the woman said. It's been two days with Jesus. He's reasoning with them, and they grow in their faith, and they get to the place where they uh, uh, have even a stronger faith. I, I think this story is important to remember because of what happens when you get over to Acts chapter 8. In Acts the 8th chapter, uh, let's back up. Acts the 6th chapter starts off with a problem in the church that the apostles say it's not right for us to neglect prayer and study the word to take care of this. So to take care of, what was the problem that they wanted to take care of? Yeah, the Taking care of the widows and the distribution of the food. So how do they respond to take care of that problem? Giving deacons. Deacon. Okay, do they appoint deacons? No. no. Uh, how do they come up with this uh, deacon? Deacon just means servant. How do they come up with these special... How do they do that? They vote yeah, they said choose amongst yourselves. This is a responsibility given to the church to <coughs> choose who these servants are going to be. So they choose how many men? Seven. You always goof this up. So six chapter and seven. seven. Is that right? Yeah. I always want to say six. No, it's six chapter, seven. I can't remember if it's six. Or seven. Okay, seven. <laughs> but it's in the sixth chapter. Okay, one of these guys, one of these guys, uh, by the way, these men, uh, apostles lay their hands on them. What's the yes. purpose of laying the hands on the deacons? Okay, when the apostles lay their hands on somebody, it gives them uh, uh, the ability to perform miraculous gifts. And these men do perform some miraculous gifts. One of the first men we read about amongst the seven here would be a guy named Stephen. In fact, the whole seventh chapter concerns Stephen, right? Stephen preaches this big sermon because he's been accused of speaking against the temple and against the law, right? What happens to Stephen at the end of his sermon? He gets <laughs> That's good Bible preaching for you. <laughs> he ends up dead. He ends up dead. Okay, so he's off our list. Now we're down to six. <laughs> We've got another deacon, though, in the eighth chapter. So we're going to follow the, an, another deacon and where he goes. What's this deacon's name in the eighth chapter? Philip. Philip. And where does Philip go? Samaria. Ha! Here we go. Here we go. He's going to go to the area of Samaria, and he's going to have a great response. Good reason for that. By the way, beautiful example of what Jesus just said, isn't it? When it comes time to harvest, mm -hmm. guess what? You're going to harvest what other people have, work other people have done. And Philip's going to swoop in and reap the benefits of work that's been done during Jesus' ministry. Yeah, great. I find it really interesting, too, that Jesus would reveal himself like this. So 
very rarely to do it. And I'm assuming it's because of the heart. Of the, you know, he knows this is going to. Let's talk about that for just a little bit. Because yeah. uh, uh, later on, as you approach the end of Jesus' ministry, he's more and more clear about who he is. Mm -hmm. right. Early on, uh, uh, not so much in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, he's vague purposefully. He says things that, that I'm quite confident people are like, what did that mean? <laughs> Born again, what does it mean? Destroy this temple, three days, I'll rebuild. What does that mean? Living, you, you know, so many things. He says so many things, I'm sure they're scratching their head. The other Gospels, though, in the Synoptics, it's quite frequent in, frequent in his early ministry when he heals somebody or reveals his glory in his early part of his ministry. What does he tell them? Don't tell, Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Okay, and we kind of put two and two together and see, in fact, Jesus specifically says, my time has not yet come. So it would bring the end too soon if he had been revealed. This is a case where he's outside Jewish territory. So he's not amongst a group of people who are going to conspire to kill him. So there's no reason to be too vague. And by the way, this is the first time in the Gospel of John, instead of just being vague, he goes ahead and explains what he means. Talking about the living water, right? He explains who he is, the Messiah. But these are these are going to be people who are not going to be involved in bringing an end to his ministry. So he is very clear. I, I find this extremely interesting because there's a sense in which these are not Jews. I know they're partial Jews, but the Jews look down on them as not Jews because they're Samaritans. Fred. What's the approximate amount of time between uh, when he turned the water into wine in the Cana? And it's his uh, mother asking to, but he said, my time, woman, my time has not yet come. Yes. But what's the period of time between when he really started his ministry? Oh. You know, when he got... Okay, that is very early in his ministry, because that's his very first miracle. Okay, has he been baptized by John at that point? Yes. Okay. Yes. I get those mixed up. His ministry starts, so we'll, we define the start of his earthly ministry at his baptism. And the reason we do that is when it's time to replace Judas. When it's time to replace Judas, they have two eligible people to replace Judas, but they define he had to be witnesses of his entire ministry. And what would that be? Baptism, Baptism through the resurrection. Right. So, so he, he told them that his time not yet come, although he really was starting his ministry. That's a little confusing. Right? Oh, yeah, I'm great. I'm glad you said this because... Um, when he said, my time has not yet come, I don't think he's referring to, uh, well, with, 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 the, uh, with the miracle at Cana, it is possible to take that to mean totally revealing himself. But I really think when he uses that phrase frequently, he's talking about, it's not time for the culmination of my ministry yet. But there at, uh, at the wedding at Cana, it does seem like he's telling his mother, you know, you're not the one to decide when I'm going to start my ministry. That's not up to you. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Fred. I'm glad you bring that up. Because it, it does have a... He was sort of stern with her, so to speak. I think so. When he says woman, there's no, there's no put down in that expression. That was an acceptable expression. But when he, when he told her it, it's not his time yet, that was definitely saying, this is not your prerogative to tell me this. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I forget how I got off on that. It was Greg's fault. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, you, you talked a little bit about Philip. Yes. And that's within the 10 years before they even start talking to the Gentiles. So, in reality, the Sumerians are a step up above a Gentile as far as the Jewish community is concerned. Yeah, they hated Samaritans, hated them terribly, hated Gentiles worse. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bad. Yes? When um, Jesus says, I have food that you know nothing about, is do you think he's trying to insult the apostles on purpose because they've overlooked Samaritans for so long? Or is that just a coincidence that he said, you would know nothing about this, but it's doing God's will? That sounds like an insult. Well, that's, I think that's a good insight, too. I think so. I'm not so sure I'd use the word insult, but I think it was meant to dig, uh, barb, whatever. He, he did that frequently with his disciples. He frequently said things like, uh, 
uh, well, put them down. And I, I, I'll go with insult. Okay. <laughs> More I talk about it. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> Very good point. Very good point. That you know nothing about because they would be, they would ignore doing God's will here uh, from their Jewish background. Okay. Um, we're down to verse, uh, after the response of the Samaritans, we're down to verse 43. It says, after the two days he left for Galilee. Okay. Let's look back at the beginning of this chapter just to remind ourselves where we are. Look at the beginning of the fourth chapter. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So, since he heard about the Pharisees, heard about him having this success, so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Okay, we have this break as he's traveling north from Judea up to Galilee, Samaria's in between, and this is where all that takes place, we're back on track for him to go up to Galilee. And it's avoiding the religious leaders, which ties in with what we just said. Why is he avoiding the religious leaders? <clears throat> it's not his time yet. Not time to totally reveal himself yet. And the pressure's on. It's building there in Jerusalem. Verse 44, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now this is really interesting. I, I like the fact that the NIV put this in parentheses. Is it in parentheses in your scripture? Okay. Um, that tells me that this is an editorial comment John is inserting here. He's not saying that Jesus said this at this time. In fact, when you compare this to the synoptics, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, Jesus said this later on in his ministry. But John, in writing about this, is going to bring up that idea. In, in other words, he's writing to a bunch of Christians and saying, by the way, you remember that Jesus said, prophets, uh, not without honor in his own, in his, it pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. He brings that up as Jesus goes back to the area of Galilee. Why? He didn't, okay. he didn't actually say this at this time, but John brings up that editorial point. Why is he bringing up that point? Jesus is going to Galilee, and what kind of reception is he going to get in Galilee? Well, there are going to be some people to respond to him, but by and large, what kind of reception does he get in Nazareth? Don't accept him. Not even his brothers during his early ministry accepts him, right? Okay, does that make sense? What's he doing now? He's, okay, why is he going back up to his own To get away from the leaders of the church. Yes, so he's going to a place where people don't accept him as well. Great place for him to continue his ministry because he's not ready to be revealed yet. Does that make sense why he would add this editorial comment here? Okay. Okay, so, verse 45, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. He did get, not quite the reception, but he did get a good reception. They welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival. What happened at the Passover festival, chapter 2? Yes. And how would, okay, we know how the religious leaders responded to that. How did they respond to that? They didn't like it at all. And what did they what did they do? Yeah, they questioned him. Isn't that interesting? They didn't throw him in jail. They didn't kill him. They, they couldn't have at this point anyway. But they didn't. They just questioned him. Which leads us to believe they're trying to hold on to their power to do these sorts of things. They question what authority do you have? In all likelihood. As best we can tell, how did the people respond to this? Yeah, <laughs> we're so glad that somebody took them down a notch, right? Mm -hmm. So these Galileans, who would probably suffer the most traveling distance to come down to Jerusalem, having to exchange their currency and buy lambs down there at terrible price and everything for the Passover feast, they would probably like the fact that here's the one who gave the religious leaders a hard time, right? Mm -hmm. They'd seen all they'd done at the Passover festival, for they were there also. They had been there also. Verse 46, once more he visited Cana. Why do we recognize that name? That's where the wedding water and the That's where the wedding feast was. That's exactly right, water to wine. It says, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, 
where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official, certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Okay, a again, on the location, Cana is a little more difficult to locate. This would be anywhere from like a 15 to 20 mile trip. Okay, in a day when you walk. Okay, that's a good day's walk, especially if it's not flat terrain, going through the mountains and the hills, right? So uh, potentially a, a, a up to a 20-mile walk. Okay, he hears that Jesus has come to Galilee, and so this royal official who has this sick son, verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him, begged him to come and heal his son who was clo close to death. The word begged here is in the imperfect tense. What that means in the Greek language is not just something that happened in the past, but here's the nuance. It's an ongoing thing. So a good translation would say, he kept on begging him. Kept on begging. Well, that tells you something. Here's somebody who thinks his son's going to die. He's probably been a royal official and just spent what he could and nothing's progressing. So he keeps on begging for him to come and heal his son who's close to death. This is a serious illness. Verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Okay, get this picture. Here's this man who I'm thinking is probably very sincere. He's very motivated. His son's close to death and he keeps on begging Jesus. And how does Jesus respond? Does this sound warm and fuzzy to you? No. <laughs> It doesn't, does it? Unless I do this, you won't believe me. Yeah, and, but notice how, it, I, I like the NIV here. He says, unless you people, unless you people see signs and wonders, wonders you will never believe. Okay, uh, push pause for just a second here. There, there was a woman, uh, we call her the Syrophoenician woman because she was outside the territory of the Jews. She was up on the Syrophoenician coast, right? She came to Jesus and had a request as well. And it was for her daughter. And when she had this request, how, what did Jesus say to her? Yeah. Do you remember what he said first, though? Remember the analogy he used? Right. It's not right to take the food from the children's table and give it to the dogs. Yes. Be nasty. <laughs> yes. It's not right to take the food from the children and give it to the dogs. Does that sound like a put down? <laughs> Uh, what's Jesus doing here? Well, let's look at that story of the Syrophoenician woman. How did the Syrophoenician woman respond? Even the dogs get the scraps from the table. Even the dogs get the scraps from the table. Mm -hmm. She would not be denied. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not a matter of pride here. There's something bigger, something more important here. And uh, did Jesus take care of her request? Mm -hmm. He sure did. He sure did. That seems to me to be a parallel to what's mm -hmm. going on here. On the surface... This sounds like a bit of a put down, but why might Jesus say something like this? Well, obviously he said it because it's true. But still, uh, why would you bring up something that grating? Yes? I think it's because you only come to me when you need something kind of yeah. a thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's, let's jump forward a little bit and then we'll come back to this, okay? What's going to happen here? We know, we've read the story. What's, what's Jesus going to do with this man's son? He's going to heal him. So is he going to answer his request? Yeah. But what's the worst thing as far as answering his request? The worst thing would be he just had his request answered and that was it. You know what would be so much better? If he had his request answered and he actually became a follower of Jesus. That would be so much better, wouldn't it? If Jesus says something like this before he heals the man's son, if, if he says, verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never, you will never believe. You'll never believe. I think, I think he's planting a seed here for this man. I think he's saying something, and I think he says it, maybe, maybe a little rough on purpose. So this man will think about... Uh, it's not just healing my son. Does he, doesn't he believe after he gets to know that his son is? That's what I think. I think that's why he's saying this. So that the man will come to faith. 
uh, uh, belief that instead of just getting his son better, <coughs> it'll bring him closer to Jesus. In fact, let's go ahead and look at this story. Mm -hmm. He says, after saying this, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. Now, now this is why I think the, imp the imperfect is so interesting, because he kept on begging him, right? And Jesus simply, after this, after this charge, that you're never going to come to faith, you're never going to believe, unless you see signs and wonders. Then he keeps on begging him, and Jesus says, Go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word. It, there is a little bit of faith there, isn't there? Because what did the man have to do? Believe. Yeah, he had a choice here. Either I can stay and keep on begging to make Jesus come with me, or I can do what he tells me to do, that he doesn't have to come with me and go back home. So he took him at his word. There is some belief. There is some trust here. And he departed, verse 51, while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that the boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, that would be the seventh hour, the fever left, left him. The father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so... He and his, his whole household believed. That's exactly right. It's not, just some, it's not just a healing, it's a miracle. What makes it a miracle? Because it's a supernatural event that points to Jesus. And in this case, it led to belief of his whole household. Verse 54, this is the second sign... Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Okay, this is kind of interesting because we know that John's using this term sign in a significant way. How do we know that? Because Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus, he said, we know that you must be from God. How do we know that? Yes, obviously Jesus said after turning the water into wine, he's been performing several miracles right yeah. in fact it's not just the third chapter it's also uh, back in chapter 2 verse 23 also makes reference of him doing many other miracles but John says this is the second what, what does he mean by that John's going to focus on some major miracles that point to belief these are the major pieces of evidence he puts out so there are other miracles that are taking place and he points that out on, on several occasions. There are a lot of other miracles taking place. But these, these are the major ones that he's focused on. By the way, I believe this is the last time that he keeps track of the... He's, he pointed out the first one, mm -hmm. and he says this is number two, but then he's not going to say this is number three and four. He's not going to continue with that. All right, chapter five. Are we ready for this? Chapter five, there's a big break between chapter four and five, and John lets us know that by saying sometime later sometime later okay you can look at matthew mark and luke and there's a lot that jesus is doing in galilee in fact it may be nine months to a year that john's going to skip over here it's a significant period of time but that's not john's purpose uh, the synoptics have already given us that record of jesus ministry he's just focusing on some major events yes what was the okay when he was there at the temple clearing what was the was that the uh, Passover. It was the Passover. Chapter 2 was the Passover. Okay, what's the time here? It says sometime later. We know it's a significant time later. Jesus went up to, he's traveling south, but he goes up to Jerusalem. And why does he say that? Because of the elevation, thank you. He went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. The fact that it uses the definite article here leads people to believe. Uh, by the way, there were three major ones that attendance was required. Okay, and what were those three major ones that you required attendance? Passover, Passover Tabernacle, Tabernacle, Tabernacle Pentecost. Pentecost. That's exactly right. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, many people think he's probably referring to the Passover. <coughs> probably referring to the Passover here, but he doesn't s uh, specify that. But he says the Jewish festival, so it must be one of the major ones, and he's going up to Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, by the way, Nehemiah in the Old Testament refers to the sheep gate for us, 
which helps clarify some of the things that John says here. He says, near the sheep gate there's a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Okay, uh, remember we talked about this before. Every time you read the word Beth, what does Beth mean? House of. House of. So Bethlehem means what? House of bread. What does Bethel mean? House of God. That's exactly right. I think we already talked about Bethsaida. What's Bethsaida? So it's up north. What is Bethsaida? House of fishing. Okay, Bethesda would be house of mercy. House of mercy. I find that fascinating that they use these kind of names. Anyway, in Aramaic, it means Bethesda and which is surrounded by uh, five covered colonnades. What's a colonnade? It's a roof held up by pillars. There you go. Sorry, there's just some terms here, and I think to myself, we don't use these terms very often anymore. But if you see some of these ancient structures, you just, just think of these large pillars to hold up a roof structure over that section. Okay, there's five covered colonnades. There was a great number of disabled people used to lie there, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Okay, before we make additional comment here, let's get the setting. He's in the area of Jerusalem, which would represent the hospital of the day. This is, this is where the sick people were. Why are they there? Because there's a pool there. Um, I, I have a friend who lives in southern Illinois outside of a little town called Sailor Springs. It used to be a booming community in the 19-teens <laughs> and 1920s because it had a spring. And everybody believed that, boy, you'll just get better. You drink this spring water. They built some big, impressive things there that haven't withstood the test of time and everything. But uh, a lot of times, mineral water and springs, especially in ancient times, people associated that with, that's the medicine of the day. That's going to help you get better. So there's a spring here by this pool that would bubble up every so often. And so uh, people have just thought, hey, that's... That's where we need to be since we're sick. Okay, now, if you're reading with me out of the NIV, at the end of verse 3, it skips and goes to verse 5. But there's a footnote there. Okay, I'm assuming all of you have a footnote there unless you're reading out of the King James Version. Is anybody reading out of the King James? Okay, what does your footnote say at the end of verse 3? <laughs> manuscripts do not have the end of 3 in verse 4. Yeah, earliest and most reliable manuscripts don't have the end of verse 3 and all of verse 4. Um, in fact, let me be a little more specific here. There, there isn't any manuscript before the 4th century that has this. Okay, that's really interesting. We've got, we've got nearly 7,000 manuscripts. And none of the earliest ones have these verses. Okay, that's point number 1. Point number 2... The texts that do have this are later. And there's a lot of variances in the texts that do have this. That's another red flag. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next comment I want to make concerns what it actually said. So the oldest manuscripts don't have this. The later manuscripts that do have this don't agree with one another. And what is the this that we're talking about? Does somebody have it in their footnote? What does the footnote say? Can you read it for me? I don't have it. That's why I'm asking somebody to read it. For the moving of the waters from the time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Okay. What does that sound? Does that sound like Bible to you? <laughs> okay. The, the, uh, because of all the manuscripts we've got, we are 100% certain about 99.99% .99 of everything in the Bible. I, I want to be careful how I say that. We are 100% certain about 
percent of what's in the Bible. And the reason I think it's important to say it that way is all the passages where we have manuscript agreement, we are 100% confident. But there are a few places, the two biggest ones are, Matthew, are, are Mark chapter 16 and John chapter 8. And just about any good translation will have a footnote there saying the most reliable ancient manuscripts don't have these passages. Okay, there are a few other small ones, such as 1 John chapter 5 and this one right, right here. Uh, John 5, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4. All right, so we know where these variances are. When you look at this, the oldest manuscripts don't have it. Number two, there's variation within the manuscripts that do have it. Number three, this doesn't seem to agree with the rest of Scripture. It doesn't seem to agree with the rest of Scripture. But this idea that an angel comes down and stirs the water every so often and the first person who gets in gets to be healed, doesn't that sound like salvation for the fittest? As far as the first one able to get in? Doesn't that also mess with the idea that there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and New Testament? If there was an angel coming down and stirring the waters and everybody knew that that was, what was taking place... So where in the world did this come from? This is referred to as a gloss. A gloss is simply means, uh, remember before the 1450s, all the copies we had of Scripture were handwritten. That's what we mean by manuscripts, right? If, I, if you were to see my Bible, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm uh, uh, trying to remember something, I do this. And I bet you you do too, don't you? You write stuff in your Bible. There's a problem, though, if you write in a Bible that's handwritten. Do you know what the problem is? <laughs> if you wrote a note in, in a manuscript that's handwritten, and somebody else picks it up later, and you had real neat handwriting, if it was me, there'd be no problem. <laughs> but if you had really neat handwriting, just like the scribe, there's a problem. That's, ex that's, that's what we figure happens here, because somewhere in the fourth century, because we don't have any of this before the fourth century, somewhere in the fourth century somebody added a gloss. And what is a gloss? It's a note somebody put in the Bible. And somebody probably thought, you know, this is probably what's happening. That's probably why they're... Because later on the passage is going to mention that while the waters are stirred, people tried to get into the waters. And so somebody's theorizing or guessing that maybe there's an angel here. So the, I want you to be familiar with that term gloss, because a gloss means an added note that got inserted and misunderstood. Please, please, 100% sure about 99.9% .9 of New Testament. We know where these problems are, and this is one of those problems areas. I think it's pretty clear, though, that this is, uh, uh, should not be taken as part of the Scripture for all the evidence that's against it. Verse 5. How do you, how do you spell gloss? G-L-O-S-S, -S, gloss. Oh, gloss. Yeah, gloss. That's my Midwestern accent. <laughs> All right. There was one there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Why in the world do you think John's pointing this out? That's pretty impressive, isn't it? 38 years. This guy can't walk. He's an invalid. 38 years. Probably also mentioning 38 years, because after 38 years being there trying to get to the water, what are you, what are you probably thinking? He's probably given up. <laughs> probably resigned his, himself, right? In fact, we get this flavor when Jesus actually talks to him. When Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned his condition, uh, uh, that he had had this condition for a long time, he asked him, I love this question, Jesus comes up to this man who's for 38 years, and he says, do you want to get well? <laughs> I don't think Jesus is being facetious. I really don't. In fact, I see Brian shaking his head over here. I think there's a good reason why Brian's shaking his head. Because a lot of times people have problems and they say they want to get over their problems. But deep down, no, they don't. They've identified themselves with that issue. This is who they are. And uh, a lot of times you're not going to get better unless you want to get better. And I think it's the most appropriate question. He asked him, do you want to get well? And by the way, does this guy answer this question? Not really. <laughs> Look how he answers the question. He says, sir, he doesn't know who Jesus is yet. By the way, and we'll figure this out, he doesn't know who Jesus is. 
He says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me. My translation says, I have no one to help me into the pool. What does yours say? I have no one to put me. Put me? There's no man to put me into No man to put me? Okay, I want to tell you something interesting because I find this hilarious. The Greek word here is balo. Do you remember what balo means? It means to throw. He literally said, I don't have anybody to throw me in the pool. Well, if it's a competition, you almost got it. Quick. Throw me, heave me, cast me. That's the word the guy, I just find that hilarious. He said, I don't have anybody to throw me into the pool when the water is stirred. Like the spring bubbling up, right? How deep is this thing? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> you better get the older pieces of <laughs> While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, get up and pick up your mat and walk. There's something very significant here I want to point out. Did this man know who Jesus was first? No. no. Did he have faith to, that he wanted to, that he believed that Jesus could heal him? No. There is absolutely no evidence of faith. There are a few examples, in fact, in the Gospel of John, if I remember this correctly, there's only one time that Jesus specifically focuses on the fact that you have to have faith and it'll heal you. Most of the time he doesn't even mention it, and there's at least four examples, and this is one of them, where as best we can tell there's no faith at all. The reason I want to point this out is sometimes faith healers, quote unquote, hide behind this idea, well, you just didn't have enough faith. Well, didn't it, wasn't a problem for Jesus. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of faith. Sometimes it's not a matter of faith. It's not an issue in the healing. It's obviously not an issue here. In fact, as we go on, this is, this is a guy, I'm not so sure he ever came to faith. But he obviously doesn't have faith at this point, right? But he tells him to pick up his mat and walk, and at once, it, how long has this guy been an invalid? 38 years. Great, 38 years. At once the man was cured, and he went to therapy, and they started teaching him how to walk. Oh, yeah. so, so. <laughs> At once he was cured, and he picked up his mat and walked. I, I think that's part of the miracle, that instantly he knew how to walk again. So he was able to walk, and he did walk. In fact, he walked well enough to pick up his bed. Right? And why did he pick up his bed? Because Jesus told him to. The day on which this took place was... <laughs> Not only is it Sabbath, Jesus went back to Jerusalem for what reason? Yeah, a major feast, probably the Passover. So it's not just the Sabbath, it's a time when Jerusalem would be crowded with people. Okay, what's the problem here? Verse 10, so the Jewish leaders <laughs> said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry the mat. <laughs> would most people in Jerusalem realize that you're violating one of the hedges, one of the traditions? Yeah, they would. They would definitely recognize that. And there, picture this, there's an ocean of crowded people and there's one guy. There's one guy with the carpet roll on his shoulder. And you know what? Everybody's going to like, hey! That guy's fine. Okay. Let me impress this. Not only was it violating one of their laws, according to Jewish tradition, which would be their laws, if you ignorantly, unknowingly violated one of their laws, which, by the way, could so easily happen. They had so many laws. Right? So if you ignorantly, unknowingly violated one of their laws, there was usually a punishment associated with that. But if you deliberately thumbed your nose, violated a law on purpose, it was within their law that you should be stoned. Could, could be stoned. You were allowed to, the Romans wouldn't let them do that. But that, their standards said capital punishment for something like that. This was a serious thing. This was a serious thing. So, when they approach this guy who's carrying his, his bedding, right, and they tell him it's the Sabbath, uh, they question him on this. He, replies in verse, uh, he replied in verse 11, the man who made me well said to pick up your mat and walk. Okay, what kind of response is that? I think, I, I agree with the cop out. I think he's passing the buck. I think he's saying, Right? I'm just doing what I'm doing. And, and the reason I think that is because what's going to happen in a little bit, not, not only what has happened to this point, this guy obviously doesn't have any, hadn't had any faith up to this point. And, and again, I'm questioning that he ever does. He just simply says, he made me do it, or he told me to do it. Verse 12, so they ask him, who was this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? 
Verse 13, the man who was healed had no idea. He had no idea. You see, we know there's not, it's not a matter of faith here, right? He had no idea, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. There's got to be a large crowd there, okay? I'd like you to write this down. Chapter 7, verses 28 through 30, and chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. Just a couple other examples in the Gospel of John where when people wanted to get Jesus and he didn't want to be gotten, couldn't get him. Just slipped away. Uh, chapter 7, verses 28 through 30. And then chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. By the way, there's another passage that I think is so interesting here because this is Jesus healing on which day? Yeah. Uh, do you know which day Jesus usually healed people as far as the Gospels are concerned? Sabbath. Sabbath day. The day that would bother most people. There's a verse, and it's over in Luke chapter 13. In Luke the 13th chapter, the 14th verse, there's a synagogue leader, and he's upset because Jesus is healing on the Sabbath day, right? So he turns to the people and he says, Guys, there's seven days in the week. Pick one of the other six days. Pick one of the other six days to be healed. Okay. The reason I like that story so much is that's compromise. That's, listen, we'll make the Jews happy, we'll let Jesus heal people and he'll be happy, you guys will get healed, we'll all be happy, just don't do it on the Sabbath day. And what does Jesus think of that? <laughs> you know, there's seven days, I think I'm going to pick the Sabbath day to heal. He is purposefully. Uh, there's a time and a place not to agitate people. There really is. There's a time for compromise. But when it comes to truth, especially when people misunderstand or misrepresent the truth, and they need to be challenged, Jesus was more than happy to challenge them. <clears throat> In your face, so to speak. So this, this Sabbath day thing is purposeful, so he can get a discussion going about the Sabbath. And by the way, this happened on many occasions. Remember the guy with the withered hand? Jesus brings him right in front of everybody and says, is, this, is it lawful to do something good on the Sabbath day? And what do the religious leaders respond to then? They didn't say a word. <laughs> didn't say a word. You know, you see Jesus looking at him. Is it okay to do something good? Well, they didn't want to answer. You can't answer that question. Nope. Yeah, Jesus even makes reference to the fact you're allowed to rescue your animal. Right. <laughs> can't you can't you help some person in need? And no, because they got so wrapped up in their own Jewish traditions. Which verse am I? Oh, verse 14. Verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him. See, you are well again after 38 years, I might add. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Okay, what does that imply? Okay, it implies not only was he a sinner, but his injury was a result of his sin. Okay, we're going to go over to the ninth chapter. We're going to find a guy blind, and the disciples are going to say, is it his fault or is it parents' fault? And Jesus is going to say, neither one. Sometimes bad things happen and it's nobody's fault. Sometimes just because you live in a sinful world. Sometimes, though, bad things happen because you reap what you sow. You did something you shouldn't have done. I think that's exactly what he's talking about here. He says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now notice what the man does. Once Jesus confronts him and tells him to stop sinning, the man went away and what does he do? Verse 15, told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Okay, I, I, I don't want to read too much into this, but you know, this almost sounds like earlier they asked him who did it. I don't know. And then Jesus talks to him, and then what does he do? He runs over to Jesus. Hey, it was him. That, that almost sounds like betrayal to me. Yes. But that's why I'm not... Just my take on this, I'm not sure this guy ever came to faith. But you know what? What's the purpose of a miracle? The purpose of a miracle is to point to Jesus in the message that he preaches. It's not always to take care of the problem. It's not always to make uh, something wrong right. It's to point to Jesus and what he says. So, uh, verse 16, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. This is an interesting comment here. Jewish leaders already didn't like Jesus. This gives them an excuse to go a little more public, right? Now they've got something they can sink their teeth into. Well, he violates the Sabbath. That's why we don't like him. No, it's not. You didn't like him before he violated the Sabbath, <laughs> right? 
They were jealous of him in the, the fact that uh, he was rocking the boat of their power and their position. Okay, so they started persecuting him. Verse 17, in his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day. I, too, am working. Okay, I want to pick up with this next week, but let's, let's make a comment or two on this. When he says, My father is always at work, didn't Jesus read Genesis chapter 1? After God created the world in six days, what does it say he did on the seventh day? Yeah, what does Jesus say when he says, My father is always at his work? Didn't you remember Jesus rested, that God rested on the seventh day? Yes, he completed creation. When it means he rested, it means he was done. Doesn't meant it, it doesn't meant. <laughs> no, that's the Floridian in me. That's like Yeah. It doesn't mean God stopped doing everything. If God stopped doing everything, the world would fall apart and cease to exist. Uh, when it talks about Jesus creating the world, being there with God in creation, he says in Colossians, the first chapter, he didn't just create the world. It says he sustains the world. He holds the world together. Um, when it said that God rested, it means he completed the creation. It doesn't mean he stopped working. And this is one of the verses that we look at to know that. But it just makes sense that he didn't stop working. Now, why is Jesus bringing that up? Because it's going to tie in with their misunderstanding of the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Totally misunderstanding it. And Jesus, Jesus is going to try to reason with them, to try to get them to see. And they're not going to see. But it's worth it because other people are probably listening. So he's going to say a lot of things that the Pharisees are just going to hate. But for the benefit of the crowds listening, he's going to say many more. So, any other questions, comments? What was the third, uh, third, um... <laughs> what you meant to say, third, Rich? Uh, <laughs> there, was, there were three feasts, third feast. Oh, the, the major feasts were Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. Very good. Let's pray.